So I'm, uh, I'll just give a quick introduction. I'm uh, Neeraj Mararka, co-founder and CTO of Bluzel. Has anybody in the room heard of Bluzel? Great, great. Anybody participated in our ICO? All right, great. So before I start, some uh, promotion. A lot of you might have seen these shirts. I've got a whole stack of them here. I don't want to take them back to Asia with me. So at the end of this uh, session, I'm going to take a few minutes and hand them out to people, lucky people. Uh, I'm going to do a quick couple slides. I don't really intend on spending a lot of time on slides. I really want to show you our demo because we came out with uh, Lovelace, which was our first product at the end of June. We're pretty proud of that. And we had a pretty big event in Singapore two days ago. And uh, you guys are kind of one of the first audiences that get to see this. Singapore was actually the first year, the second. So uh, what is Buzel? Let's see here. So what we're building here is a database. It's a decentralized database. It's not based it's not a blockchain, but it's based on blockchain technologies. So what you can see there is a bunch of swarms. Each swarm consists of multiple nodes. And when your data gets stored to the swarm, like say these key value pairs, they get broken up into swarms. So you can see in this example, there's three different swarms that stored your key value pairs. You got the first two that went to one swarm. You got the second one, that third one that went to another swarm. And the last three key value pairs went to a third swarm. So there's obviously some pretty big benefits of having your data chopped up and stored across different swarms. There's security benefits, reliability benefits, security, performance. Um, we're right now, so we actually have a Buzel token that was launched in January, as some people know about. It's part of our ICO. We also have a BNT token, which is going to be our native token. And uh, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show a quick video. If I play a video, is the audio going to... Anyways, you guys can see the video later on YouTube. It's uh, talking about the video, promotional video. What we're going to do now, uh, how many people in the room, how many people in the room are uh, Solidity programmers or pro work with Solidity, Ethereum developers? OK. I guess some of you are going to see Ethereum Solidity programming maybe for the first time today. So um, what we have here is my Ether wallet. And what we've done is we've deployed a smart contract already onto Ethereum, onto Robston, which is the testnet. And what we're demonstrating here is one of the integrations we have. So Bluzel, just to go back to what I was talking about, Bluzel is a decentralized database. And the goal here is to allow smart contract applications as well as non-smart contract applications to use the database. So we have a support for Ethereum and Neo right now. And what I'm going to demonstrate in a couple of moments is how to use it from Ethereum. You can also use the database from Python, JavaScript, Ruby, PHP, and you can also build libraries to talk to the Wazell database. So if I have time, I'll try to demonstrate that we have a WebSockets API so that regardless of what programming language or platform you're on, you can qu pretty quickly use our database for whatever you need. And I'll demonstrate that right away. So here you have the smart contract address. This is the ABI. And the ABI is really just a calling interface. Let's not worry about that too much. But what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate a few steps here. We're going to first try to write a value to the database from an Ethereum smart contract. So let's see if that value actually gets into the Buzel database. So um, we're going to do add. And what I'm going to show here is our client. So this is our CRUD client. And what it's showing you is it's a direct connection to the Buzel database. This does not use the blockchain. It does not use Ethereum. It's a client running on our machine, talks directly to the swarm, the Buzel swarm. And you can directly inspect or change values. So these are a bunch of key value pairs we've already been demonstrating. Uh, what I'd like to do is ask the audience for a key value pair, a key and a value. Anyone? How about the gentleman in the back there that keeps raising his hand? Yep, I'm looking at you. Okay, Sorry? Can't hear you. Yep. Oh, OK. How do you spell that? Okay, I, I'm just going to spell something here. <laughs> Whip cream. All right. Is that good? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to do the key, uh, the key earring and the value whipped cream. And we're going to do a write. So this is talking to something called Oracleize, which allows a blockchain to talk to things off the blockchain. 
And what we're doing here is we're putting in a small amount of Ethereum we're paying. We don't actually need this much Ethereum, but there's a service called Oracleize that takes a small amount of Ethereum, a microtransaction fee, to provide that service. And now we're going to generate the transaction. Say yes. Don't bother stealing my private key. This is just testnet Ethereum. It's not of much value. And we're going to submit it. Now we're going to view the transaction. And this is going to take a few moments because it obviously has to confirm on the blockchain. So just to clarify, this is not the speed of the Luzel database. We are constrained to the speed of a blockchain. If you're on a faster blockchain, this obviously won't take very long. And if you're, say, doing this on JavaScript, it takes you know, less than a second. Uh, anybody have any questions so far while we're waiting? Yes. Sure. What's the difference between this and a sharded architecture? Uh, which one? Sharded architecture. Sharded document? Sharded architecture. Uh, this is a sharded architecture, actually. We are, we're basically taking your data and we're sh putting it into shards. As I showed earlier, we call it partitions, shards, and your data will get split up. Right now, the release that we have, we have a single swarm. So your data is not technically being sharded right now, but the roadmap is to go to that point. So, yep. I think you need to wait at, at least one hour for six confirmation on the blockchain. Correct. Well, depending on what blockchain you're on, but okay, yeah, exactly. It's not a question. Yep. Uh, who's the administrator of uh, That's a great question. It's decentralized. We're not administering it. The nodes are actually being run by p farmers. So just like if you're on Bitcoin and you're, so what's um, your business model? pardon me, what's your business model? our business model, we're providing value-added services to Bluezel. Okay. Yeah. So we're providing value-added services, um, and uh, you know we've got partnerships. I haven't shown that slide, but uh, for the purposes of brevity, yeah. So let's see here now. Uh, we've got the transaction confirmed. Let's now go back to our client and do a refresh. And, whoop. Having a bit of a network, network connectivity issue here. Did we? There we go, we're pre. So now what I'm going to do is, just to show that this isn't smoke and mirrors, I'm going to change the value. Can I get another value? Onions. Onions. Somebody likes them. OK, onions. OK, so we're going to save this back to the swarm. And now what we're going to do is we're going to read back that value to show that the Ethereum smart contract indeed is able to get that value back. And that was erring. E-R-I-N-G. So as you can tell, uh, on Ethereum, typically if you're doing a read, you're not going to have to pay anything. But we're actually doing something off chain. We have to still make a write. That's just the way the blockchain is. So we're generating a transaction again. And we have to send it. Now this one's going to take a little bit longer. And the reason is um, we're writing a transaction to the blockchain. Oracleize in between has to actually wait for that transaction has to go to the swarm, and then it has to public, uh, publicize a callback. So we have to actually wait for two round trips. Or sorry, one whole round trip. So um, who wants a shirt while I'm waiting? Sure. OK, sizes. Uh, what size are you, gentlemen? Large. It's large. All right. Um, I don't know if I have an extra large, but I will give you, oops. I got here. This is, I believe, is a, nope. Give me a moment. There you go. Great, thank you. Who else raised their hand? A medium. You want a medium? Is that still waiting? What will be the target of the user? What is the target use? Uh, it's, a, it's a general purpose database. I mean, it's a key value store. Think of it as a decentralized Redis. So, so, I mean, so you, but you must have targets. Well, the, our, our, target mar our target market is the app developers right now. Yeah. That's why we have, we're focusing on Ethereum right now. So which kind of apps? Uh, like, like, what, what you really think, oh, shit, they, they should use? Uh, 
The, that's a good question. So GDPR came up earlier. One of the reasons that you don't want to be storing data on the blockchain is expense. But one of the other reasons that people haven't really, I guess it hasn't dawned on people, is the fact that you can't store immutable data on the blockchain that relates to citizens of the EU, for example. And actually, this is going to probably translate to the rest of the world. If you're a company in Canada providing services to even one EU citizen, you have to adhere to GDPR. So for example, if you got a D app and you're storing any kind of KYC data, any private data relating to individuals, you can't store it on the blockchain, you got to find an off-chain data store. So right now, one of the things we're actually working on is building collaborations with companies that do KYC. In fact, the Buzel database came about because we were building a KYC solution in Singapore. So let me just check and see now if the read actually completed. And... As you can see, there's actually a callback. It's not very easy to read, but that callback is actually the response to our read request. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to my ether wallet now, and we're gonna say, give me the last value that was read back. Onions, there you go. So we were, what did we just demonstrated to reiterate, we wrote a value from a blockchain to the Bluezell Swarm. We changed the value off chain on the Swarm itself, read it right back into the smart contract. That's your two-way flow that we're trying to demonstrate here. Now, how much time do I have left? Anybody keeping time? 20 minutes? No? Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is I'm going to show a visualizer. And the visualizer gives you um, a pretty good view of what is going on in the database. Think of it as like a heartbeat dashboard. You might have seen similar things with um, if you, you looked at Ethereum's, similar things with Ethereum. So uh, I'm not sure why it's not rendering properly here, but let's do it here. All right, there you go. So this is a visualizer. It's talking to the swarm right now. And you know it's showing several different things like latency, talking to the nodes, uh, the number of databases that we've had ever since we powered up our test net, uh, the number of peers that we have, total key value pairs. The CRUD commits is actually going up monotonically because it's the number of commits since we started the swarm. And um, yeah, just some graphs basically representing the numbers that I just read. So we're going to be making this visualizer public and it'll allow you if you're participating in the network or using the network to be able to inspect and see what's going on with the entire test net and eventually when we have our uh, public net. Great. Now hopefully I can show you a quick JavaScript application. So what I've done here is I've written a little hello.js app. It connects to our swarm. You can see that it's making a WebSocket connection. It's using the Buzel library, which is a node.js library. And um, I'm just going to put a value in here of Netherlands, or sorry, country. Uh, and I'll put in the letters NL. And then I'm going to read back country. Now, let's just make sure that country is not already in there. And it's not. So I'm going to save that. And now what I'm going to do from a JavaScript application is I'm going to run this program. <clears throat> and it now it just wrote back whatever I read I wrote, but actually it, what actually happened is it did a create and then it read it back. Now what we'll do is we'll go back to this editor again, do a refresh to show that it actually did get stored in here. And there you go, country, NL, there you go. So any questions on this so far? Yep. Uh, what was the purpose of your ICO? What was the purpose of it? Yeah, why do you need the tokens? Uh, the tokens are actually quite critical for uh, the crypto economics that we haven't demonstrated yet. So we have supply and demand. Supply is the farmers that are providing nodes to the network. Demand is the use of the services. Um, what we haven't actually talked about here that you'll see in our YouTube video later on is our data economy, which is something we're building on top of the database. Because the database you can think of as infrastructure. But what's really the next step with Bluezell is having this whole data economy where you can now syndicate data and you get paid for syndicating your data. You can also have data wallets and data marketplaces where people can actually treat data like a currency. So one of the things Bluezell is trying to do is push the idea that data is actually the new currency. If you're using Facebook, for example, you think it's free. It's not. 
you're actually providing your data to Facebook. Data is a form of currency. So what we're trying to do now is give you a data wallet so that as a consumer using a social network or any kind of service, your data is treated like that. And the crypto economics of it is driven by the Buzel token, which was the uh, basis of our ICO in January. It's a public database. We're, the, the notes, we're currently running the notes for the testnet, but the long-term goal is for pub, members of the public to be running those nodes. They get compensated for running those nodes with the Bluezell token. And it doesn't matter whether you use the Ethereum network or you use uh, uh, another network, Mozilla, whatever. It's all the same decentralized database. Correct. It's all the same database. So a Zilliqa app could share data with another app that's running on Ethereum that could share an app that's running C++ or C Sharp, because it's all the same backend database running across the swarms. It's just a matter of sharing your data to the right entities. Yeah. OK, um, we have any more questions? Otherwise, I'm going to hand out shirts. Last question, I have a mic. Values or you store some kind of cash from this database? Uh, currently, for the test net, we're storing the data literally plain text. There's no security in place whatsoever. What we're planning to have is several different levels of security. For example, if you're providing syndicated data that you want to sell, it'll be encrypted. If you want to provide a public directory of data, that will be pretty straightforward. It will be plain text. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is order preserving encryption so that if you want to share your data, even though it's encrypted, you'll be able to do that. It's a pretty advanced um, computer science problem. We have advisors that are helping us on these sorts of things. So th the short answer is yes, you will have encryption, but it will be an option, not something you're required to do. Yeah, but the data is stored directly on the blockchain? The, oh, the data is not stored on the blockchain. It's oh. stored on the Bluezell Swarm. What I just demonstrated is actually an example where you could be on the blockchain and you want to store data off the blockchain. And that's what we just demonstrated. Oh. Yes. So um, yeah, I'll just take a few minutes to hand out shirts, if that's OK. Yeah, Great. So you know what I'm going to do? Instead of um, asking people their sizes, I'm going to read out sizes, and then people just raise their hands. I think this is a more efficient algorithm. So I got a large. OK. I got a little more large. Um, give you a hand you. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, I got another large. Yeah. There you go. Thank you, sir. <laughs>